Hey guys, Akiba back for Crypto Slate for the Slate cast. Today with us, we have uh, two representatives from um, Biddle Asia and APAC DAO. It's going to be really interesting to see what's going on over in the Asia market. Stay with us. Okay, Erica and Nicole, great to see you. How are you guys doing? Hi, how are you? Doing well. Yeah, I'm not too bad. Hi. Not too bad. <laughs> so how, how are things going over where you are? Are you both in uh, in Vietnam or? Actually, we are. Coincidentally. <laughs> Coincidentally. <laughs> I'm mostly in Seoul, Korea, so I'm kind of going back and forth. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we happen to be both in Vietnam at the moment. Okay, cool. Um, so... Uh, APAC DAO and Biddle Vietnam, um, Biddle Asia, um, how do they all work together and what's kind of, uh, what, what's going on? Obviously, we've just had a, a big event that seems to have gone great. I spoke to some of the um, the speakers, uh, it was a fantastic lineup. Um, yeah, how are things going over there? How What's the what's the state of play? Nicole, do you want to intro? <laughs> do you want to go ahead? I think Thanks. you can just start for us, Erica. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm the founder of Crypto Soul, and mostly we help community building for builders in the Korean community. Um, mm -hmm. But I thought that the Asian market or community also, you know, needs support as well, not just for the Korean community. So mm -hmm. um, Nicole and I are really, you know, good friends from like 2018. So I, and I lived in Vietnam for two years. So. Um, Aside from uh, hosting a Biddle Asia conference in Korea, I you know tried for the first time to host a Biddle Asia conference outside of Korea. So mm -hmm. the first one being in Vietnam, so thus called Biddle Vietnam. So mm -hmm. that happened a month ago, and Nicole with her and other project APAC DAO, we decided to collaborate together. So coming from both ends, um, so mm -hmm. that was our uh, first collaboration this year, and yeah, it went really well. Fantastic. So, uh, Nicole, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, APAC DAO and, and what you're, you guys are doing there? So, uh, I think with uh, APAC DAO, I think as Erica mentioned, this Biddle Vietnam is our first uh, attempt to host a, a tech-focused conference outside of Korea and specifically in Vietnam. So, I think people have heard a lot about Vietnam, but, you know, in mm -hmm. the past three years, of course, it was very uh, troublesome. It was very challenging, you know, to go and then to kind of, uh, you know, get to know the ecosystem here. So I think this conference is like a good uh, opportunity for everyone just to, to check out the ecosystem. And of course, we are hoping to do a follow-up conference next year as well, uh, that we would be able to bring in more friends and more people coming over and show them what uh, you know Vietnam and, and, and Southeast Asia has to offer. Uh, so mm -hmm. APAC DAO is also my uh, main project right now. So it's a Web3 community based in Vietnam and, and Southeast Asia. So we also share the same mandate of, you know, like powering more Web3 builders in mm -hmm. Asia. Uh, and of course, like through these uh, community initiatives. So happy mm -hmm. to chat more about how you can help you guys. Yeah, fantastic. I, I was meant to make it uh, uh, both of those conference, but obviously the, the, the travel time and the time difference and other things going on. So I really hope that I can make it over there. I've not been to Southeast Asia yet, but it's somewhere it's on my, my bucket list, uh, plenty of time. So um, yeah, looking forward to meeting you guys out there maybe next year sometime. That'd be fantastic. Um, so in terms of the, the Asian markets and the, the ecosystem the communities there, what would you say are some of the, the major differences between some of the Western markets and what's going on in crypto there? Just to start off with the Korean market and also just in, I think Asia in general, um, I think there's an information asymmetry actually uh, okay. between, I think the language barrier is definitely a huge thing. Um, mm -hmm. Although we're typically English friendly, but still I think it is not our main language. Um, so just translation issues in terms of the main documents. I think, you know, Twitter play as well is not very strong on our front, I think, in, in mm -hmm. many uh, ways. So in that sense, it does kind of... Um, shift a little bit back uh, in terms of the speed and also the follow-ups, right? Because communication is a big, big, um, you know, it's supposed to be very fluid, fluent in, across mm -hmm. regions. But I think in reality, it is quite dif difficult, right? Um, so, so our role is to that, kind of be the bridge, right? Yeah. 
Is, is there a different social platform that's more popular over there, over there for crypto? Because obviously we have crypto Twitter and we think of that as being the entirety of crypto. What, mm -hmm. what, what are we missing out on from Southeast Asia and Asia in general? Well, I mean, Vietnam, of course, Nicole, I mean, you should know really well, of course, but like, <laughs> Facebook is definitely a huge platform um, right. for every type of communication, mm -hmm. right? And, and Nicole also mm -hmm. runs like huge, you know, Facebook groups. And I think uh, that really plays a huge role in summoning, you know, these uh, committee members, right? Mm -hmm. And Korea is, I think Facebook is also pretty big still, but, um, at, but Twitter is, has been very uh, unfamiliar, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. until crypto twitter came around we're like oh well we should get used to this so it took it's taking a lot of time for us to really get used to the whole crypto twitter system um mm -hmm. so discord is also new for us uh but it's still it's kind of catching up uh, because of the nft trend these days um mm -hmm. so that's kind of catching up on korea discord and uh, facebook's pretty strong still but uh yeah i think southeast asia's like facebook is more stronger than i think korea and uh, northeast asia what do you think nicole Mm. Uh, yeah, I think definitely Facebook here is very popular, especially because, you know, the Southeast Asia is one of the biggest gaming hubs, you know, in the world. And mm -hmm. when it comes to gaming and gamify, you know, a lot of people still, you know, they're still so used to these gaming, uh, these Facebook groups uh, and Facebook pages where you can actually communicate about your project. So, I mean, it's there's some kind of inheritance in terms of the, the, the channels out there. And I think you guys mentioned as well, like Southeast Asia, it's a huge market, but it's also very fragmented. Uh, actually, yeah. the, the first kind of advice that everyone, you know, would give you when you go to this area is that localization is very important, local partnership is very important, um, because mm -hmm. we actually don't kind of have a, 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 the same language and the culture also differs very much from one country to another. So mm -hmm. unless you have a, a strong kind of local presence through your partnership, it's also very hard, you know, in terms of ecosystem development or compliance, uh, just to have your presence out here. So I think one of the key mandates of us for, for little Vietnam and little Asia is of course, like how to bring together like different projects, especially from the Western side to Asia and, mm -hmm. you know, see how this collaboration can forge on and, and improve. Uh, and we have seen this difference, you know, in terms of the connection when we can do this physical kind of conference. So people have been talking a lot about, you know, like virtual remote working and everything, but mm -hmm. we can see the difference when we actually can do this and people can actually know the other and build the trust before they can do collaboration. So I think those are some of the major differences uh, when it comes to, to Southeast Asia as well. Are you seeing um, much kind of uptake in kind of, um, you talk about virtual um, conferences and sort of, or virtual uh, communications there with kind of metaverse projects um, in Asia and a way of, of using that as a way to connect remotely? Mm -hmm. uh just to you know i just have th thought up of a one that was kind of interesting to me but you know koreans like drinking a lot and you know <laughs> <I> think, <laughs> and usually drink like with your friends offline um but there has been a platform uh, metaverse platform where you can drink virtually together meaning mm -hmm. that you have your glasses and like you kind of meet up in this virtual platform so you mm -hmm. can kind of drink together and you know chat with like similar issues and so i think that's kind of interesting it kind of correlates the drinking culture and also the metaverse platform. So I thought that mm -hmm. was pretty cool. And I think not only one, but there's several of those uh, that just popped up in the Korean community. That's pretty interesting. And mm. um, yeah, so I think uh, like having, enjoying that like experience with your friends in the metaverse platform due to the COVID, of course, I think that was mm -hmm. the facilitating factor that really like flourished all these like metaverse, um, you know, games or these like social platform mingling platforms and so such mm -hmm. uh, such so that's what i kind of see in the korean uh ecosystem but what else in southeast asia do you see nicole <laughs> passing it on so uh yeah I, I think this also resonates very well with the with the theme that we're trying to do like reaching you know different different countries and different ecosystems uh mm -hmm. so we see i think with metaverse maybe there's an, uh, an increasing trend that i see is that people i mean they wanted to know the other through these virtual space first but mm -hmm. then they also want to come offline, you know, just to discuss business. I know it sounds very traditional and still very reserved, but I, I mm -hmm. guess that's also the main point of, that's also one of the main difference about Asia is that I think we, we also want to invest more of our time in building trust. And basically the physical connection is definitely inevitable if you want to do it. So I think Metaverse actually plays a, a pivotal role in kind of getting you to know more people. But then mm -hmm. it's gonna have some, there would come more opportunities for you to convert these connections to 
physical connections or real connections mm-hmm. outside, you know, of these spaces. And that's why I think all of these conferences, uh, what we are planning to do, of course, uh, before the physical conference is that basically we also have like different sessions, different networking kind of events as well for people to get to know uh, uh, other people. And basically you can curate all of these checks and agendas so that people would know who to expect, who to meet up with when they come to the conference. So I think mm-hmm. this is one of the ways that we can also try out and sample with with Duro so that the next year is going to be something more, I think, more fruitful and more impactful and, and, and resourceful for everyone. I think it's really interesting you say there about kind of um, meeting online and then doing business offline. Um, in my experience within crypto, it's almost the reverse in that you meet at a conference like, say, ECC or Denver. And then the business happens on Telegram. <laughs> Like so many deals mm-hmm. happen on Telegram. Is that mm-hmm. a, a very a, a different thing within the Asian markets then that like Telegram isn't as big a deal and people are, are, are kind of finalizing deals actually offline in person? I, I think Telegram is definitely a, a huge deal, uh, especially people for people working in the crypto c- system. But mm-hmm. I think uh, in terms of the business, like actually finishing the business um, and making like confirmation, the deal needs to be like offline for sure. And I think... Oh, wow. um, yeah, I think people do care about like familiarity and, mm-hmm. you know, that really comes from like meeting that person, having lunch with the person, mm-hmm. you know, getting to know the person first. And then, you know, I'm not Chinese, but like there's like 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 the, you know, the relationship building is so mm-hmm. important. But I really agree to that because and I can so see that in the Korean uh, system as well, mm-hmm. where you you have to really trust that person to and believe in that person to kind of make the next step. And I think that yep. also plays into crypto as well. So I do see a lot of that um, happening. Yeah. So do you, do you think that is more of a slightly cultural difference in, in the way that that happens? I think so. I mean, of course, COVID has really limited a lot of these, you know, uh, offline uh, interactions. Mm-hmm. And so people had to deal with this uh, limitation, but they would much prefer having an offline, um, you know, interaction more so than the online one. So that's, mm-hmm. I think, more of a cultural, it's been, I think, in the cultural, like, you know, foundation for quite some time. And yeah, I thought it was pretty natural for me because I was born here and raised here. But uh, I mm-hmm. guess not yeah i guess not for some countries as well but anyway yeah well, I, I mean it, it i mean my background is that i worked in sort of uh, in web 2 for 15 years i ran a marketing agency and like mm-hmm. no deal would get done online in the traditional like sort of legacy space but then when i moved into the crypto space from a professional point of view i've been involved in some form since about 2014 but when i moved to work with crypto Slate, i was amazed at how many like huge deals would happen just on telegram messages um, and I think there is maybe an argument as to whether that good deals do need to be in person because there's also been a, a, a lot of mistakes happening in crypto over the last two years. And, and maybe part of that is due to that sort of maybe slightly anonymous approach uh, and maybe the human touch is, is, is uh, more needed. Um, is that something you, you guys would agree with or? So uh, I guess, yeah, I think pretty much with even with Vietnam, like in the in the past couple of years, especially, you know, after COVID. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think people, of course, they are they are more used to getting online. And, you know, let's say the, the starting and the, the finishing would be definitely, you know, within like online. So you check out everything you want to pay, do the payment and stuff. You do all of the reviews and everything. It's they are definitely kind of online. But they're still kind of um, in the transition to this, what we call digital transformation or whatever. But I mean, it's mm-hmm. pretty much what we want, how much we can tap in the, the existing kind of resources that we have, you know, when we are at home. So basically, I think with the, with the starting and finishing, definitely they are online. But there's a very, very big uh, chunk of the market which is moving from offline, online to offline as well. Like mm-hmm. a lot of the, so let's say after this uh, COVID, so there's consolidation of a lot of businesses. So people mm-hmm. going online, people want kind of, you know, kind of combine and they kind of want to consolidate. But then when it comes to the, you know, come to the more important part, as you said, all of the major deals, all of the, the, the big kind of purchases, uh, still people here, they are, there are some, a lot of these platforms which help people to convert from online to offline businesses. Because basically in, 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 in Asia, I think in general, we still, we still prefer human connections. I don't know, like that might be something different. Uh, I haven't been back to the, to the West for so long. But I think mm-hmm. here it's still like there's a there's a huge kind of part around, you know, all of the family, all of the group, all of the collective 
kind of communities that you can have. And pretty much before you can actually think about business as a group or as a person, there's always this kind of building trust uh, between on one person from another. And mm -hmm. I think this also resonates well with the Web2. Let's say if you're talking about Web3 and you want to tap in more Web2 people, uh, mm -hmm. even the builders or the users, right? So that's still something that you have to take into account uh, when you want to grow your business in blockchain. Mm -hmm. well, that, that's actually a, a great tie into what I wanted to ask next in terms of thinking about sort of the, the two groups here in terms of um, ev like everyday users, retail users within crypto and the, the developer sort of scene within sort of uh, the South Asia market. So let's start with in terms of the developer uh, area. Do you see there be, is there a, a wealth of talent there that is currently underutilized or is it more of a helping to bootstrap and um, do like hackathons and, and educate people into, into Web3? Um, what is kind of the, the state of sort of development over there? Uh, for, for, I can talk about Korea or I think mm -hmm. Nicole can elaborate more on Vietnam. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah, but as in terms of South Korean market, I think the population is definitely, you know, pretty, pretty lim limiting. I mean, it's not a humongous population, but still mm -hmm. the talent is definitely there. Um, a lot of people who stayed from like way before 2017, 2018 um, in crypto, you know, they're still trying out new projects. They're building new things. I can mm -hmm. definitely see some movement in terms of the builder market, the developer um, uh, community. Uh, there's a lot of study groups happening that's popping up these days, especially mm -hmm. because of the wave of the Web2, um, you know, developers uh, coming on to the Web3, you know, wave. So they do want, they do studies in like DeFi or NFT or even just like language like for example learning rust or learning you know solidity those mm -hmm. type of you know um, courses are definitely rising these days it seems like um i think there was like a lot of words about oh we need we need to do more education but i think this is like the time to really execute so right. um it, it is definitely i can definitely see that movement which is a very positive um sign mm. and thus i think that's why there's a lot of hackathons being hosted in korea as well uh, including mine as well, mine, but um, mm -hmm. I think that really fostered a lot of interest and a lot of building activity. And what we try to do, and Nicole and I, is to bring about that interest in the builder, you know, space, and not just talk about like you know the price movements, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I, I do see some positive, you know, movements. That's why we're happy to do more and more because we do have see some increasing traction. So. Yeah. And I think one of the interesting things on there, I and mean, we will I'll ask you, Nicole, about Vietnam in a second, but the difference between, say, hackathons in Web 2 versus Web 3. In Web 3, you can do a hackathon, develop a project, and then the go-to-market can be instant almost. Whereas mm -hmm. with Web 2, there's just so much more around building interest and marketing, et cetera. If there's a use case, but people often say, there's, oh, there's not enough use cases in crypto. But the thing is, if you create a use case, you can go to market instantly, can't you? Like, that's probably why there's more interest as well, because you see, like, like Pinata came from a hackathon, for instance. One inch came from a hackathon. Like these sort of projects um, can go straight to market. Right, absolutely. Um, and I see so many, you know, winners of Hack Adam Soul, for example, with the Cosmos Hackathon. You know, they just released like their product just like recently, and mm -hmm. it's been only three months since they won the hackathon, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the the reaction is real. I think people do see like they have the. A, the, yeah, the attractive part about this is like you can actually release it and see how it goes and like you can test it out in the market right away. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kind of a, a way to debut in the in the builder space as well. It's mm -hmm. like you can literally just like show off what you can build. And um, yeah. that's like a really good showcase for the you know crypto builder space. So yeah, I, I definitely see that marriage. And I think the Web2 developers have been amused at this very, you know, characteristic. Like, wow, this is like super fast, a lot of incentives. A lot of mm -hmm. you know continu continuity, right? So uh, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's pretty attractive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, what are your thoughts, Nicole? Uh, so, I think definitely, uh, I think we've seen more interest in, of course, all of these activities like hackathons, you know, for Web three, especially even from the Web two builders. And what we are trying to do, I think, apart from the conference that we are hosting, I mean, I'm also running. I think we are planning towards something like which is definitely a bit ambitious here, but. I think we are talking about like a developers hub for like, which is a bit chain agnostic, you know, for the community here, not only in Vietnam, but Southeast Asia. So the reason mm -hmm. that we've seen this is that I think all of the layer ones or all of the technical projects, of course, when they come to Southeast Asia, so they know the lesson. So definitely they, they want to work with a partner and they want to build their own kind of ecosystem. 
But then the thing is that the, the current Web3 ecosystem, you know, is still, still very small. And mm -hmm. I think with all of these activities, if we just keep doing this in the Web3 kind of approach, it's going to be also very tough for, I think, the newbies to, to tap in and kind of, you know, explore different opportunities here. So I think with what we are trying to do here, of course, other than the webinars, uh, the hackathons and so on, uh, I think we want to create like a space for them to be to actually kind of communicate across different communities and sharing about different opportunities that they have, you know, mm -hmm. in, in, in here. I know that that's a bit ambitious because I think right now a lot of the, the chains or ecosystem, they really want to build their own thing. Um, but mm -hmm. then we are trying to kind of, let's say, at least have a discord or a group of people just to be, a, to be able to actually have a forum, you know, to, just to discuss about different opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so that before that, once we will be able to get in more web two builders, then it's going to be easier for us to kind of have, build different track for them to explore different kind of web three projects. So I think, in my opinion, um, it, it's going to be a, a, it's going to be very ambitious, very different, very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. But then we are trying to kind of uh, pull in more resources from the web two, uh, from different languages, of course. Golang, we are working with Golang Vietnam and a couple of other web two communities here. And once we're able to show them the, the bigger opportunities they can have when we come together, hopefully this is going to benefit everyone in the ecosystem. I think especially even the smaller and, you know, smaller chains or smaller projects, because uh, a lot of them, you know, when they come to Vietnam, they would ask us like how, how we can compete or how we can have or, you know, attract a lot of developers to the events. And I think the only answer that we have is that obviously you need to tap in like, you know, other ecosystem and definitely differentiate yourselves by showing the opportunities that developers can have with your project. Um, then we are also trying to help like smaller kind of players in that sense. Fantastic. So, I mean, I'm, a, I'm aware and it's something that, that we've actually got on our radar is maybe a, a slight hole that we have um, in both the Asian time zones and also it, it sort of the, the news for what's going on over in Asia. What do you think that um, investors and just general crypto enthusiasts are missing out on by not paying as much attention to the Asian markets? <laughs> Uh, I think the sheer, you know, interest in, in crypto and not only in terms of investing, but also in education and also just like mm -hmm. being able to contribute to the ecosystem. I think that they're missing out on that kind of recognizing that. Um, I think, of course, of the geographical, you know, uh, difficulty limitations and it, it is hard to I'm travel home. for yeah. sure. It, yeah. Different mm -hmm. time zones. It's definitely hard to like work together in that sense um, in many aspects. But I think the, uh, I think people should definitely take into account that um, you know Asian. Well, I don't want to generalize too much, but I think you mm -hmm. know Asians are usually you know pretty flexible when it comes to new new things. And I think you know in terms of crypto as well, it's pretty familiar now to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And the the I guess familiarity and the natural like adapt, adapt adaptation, like that kind of a set. Uh, how do you say it? recognition is really mm -hmm. important in especially testing out new products and services right and mm -hmm. uh i think asian market is definitely a good test bed for that <laughs> in many aspects and also yeah. also gaming of course is a huge huge market i mean mm -hmm. it's it's the you know one of the best right so i think that's mm -hmm. also something that people should definitely take into account and especially DeFi. i mean i think many um, it's just all products right DeFi is also like people love to invest they like to you know triple their <laughs> you know, savings whatever and it's just many uh interests on the asian front is being neglected, I think, um, as mm -hmm. being disregarded in that sense. So if people could kind of take a little bit more closer look and just kind of mm -hmm. see for themselves, basically, just kind of visiting maybe once a year, just like seeing how it is and just seeing the active, I guess, um, interest in, in crypto, I think that's really uh, something to see. So yeah, I highly recommend. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the thing that I'm hearing the most within the industry at the moment in the bear market is the move towards gaming and the fact that that could be the next impetus for a, the next sort of bull run. Um, so I do think it's a very uh, salient point that um, Asian markets are, yeah, gaming is much bigger. I actually have on my other monitor right now the Dota 2 International that's going on in Singapore right now because um, I'm a, a big gamer right. myself. Um, so yeah. I, I think it is something that should have more attention. It's something that, say, here at Crypto Slate, we do have focus on it being one of the areas for us to um, spend more time on and kind of build into our offering, which is why I'm really happy to be chatting to you both uh, today. Um, in terms of Vietnam, uh, Nicole, what, what's, 
what would you say is kind of the most exciting thing going on there at the moment for crypto in your opinion ah oh, there are too many had to pick one <laughs> <laughs> i think uh there are so many reasons why we picked vietnam for the conference right so uh i think korea and vietnam are definitely two of the I think two of the most um, interesting or emerging hubs uh, for, you know, for blockchain kind of players. And that's the reason mm -hmm. why we're, we have done this this year and we're planning to do like a, maybe a dual conference next year. Because uh, there's a very strong tie between the ecosystem uh, and I, like from Korea and Vietnam. And Korea does have a very good bridge with, uh, with the West and uh, especially on the US side, you know. So basically we are kind of uh, trying to plan this as a, kind of a tour or an itinerary for people to check out like from like from the Western countries to check out the ecosystem here. So Korea and Vietnam definitely share the same, some of the, uh, I think some of the similarities like uh, the robust uh, developers community. Vietnam mm -hmm. has always been, has also been one of the, the largest outsourcing hubs and gaming hubs. Mm -hmm. So I think definitely mm -hmm. there's a reason why it has always been among the top markets for game development and also for game users in the past, mm -hmm. uh, I think since last year. So um, I guess like in terms of the market, you can de definitely not overlook Vietnam and Asia because definitely, mm -hmm. you know, there are like, um, how many was that? Over 3 billion something people. <laughs> and if we talk mm -hmm. about the number of gamers who haven't been get on board with blockchain gaming or gamify, that's like, I don't know, over a billion at least. So pretty much in terms of market, this is something not to miss. The second yeah. is with the resources. I'm pretty sure that the um, the interest in terms of developing your games or you know building your own startup here is huge. Um, I also once spoke to my friends that actually Web three and decentralization is very much the opposite of what we were taught at school. You know or how right. we were brought up at school with Asia. So because before, of course, we were pretty much like we had to rely on a lot of these centralized parties. Centralization mm -hmm. has always been at the core of our education. But with mm. Web3, there are so many, there's so much opportunity, you know, and so much more that we can do outside of, you know, what we have been taught. And I mm. think it's also a way for a lot of the, the creators and also with the builders here to, to explore how they can do with Web3, you know, with, uh, let's say, with significantly less resources. And mm -hmm. they also don't have to rely on a lot of these centralized parties to launch the project. So I think that's mm -hmm. why the, the, of course, the gaming, the metaverse and the NFT ecosystem here have been booming. Because uh, actually, of course, it's not just about people speculating, but people want to explore and build something on their own with Web3. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's, that's how this is going to be something more sustainable and I think more motivating for people to explore Asia. Just, mm -hmm. just to add a little bit more like on what Nicole just said is, um, people do want the opportunity. Like they, I think a lot, most people really want the opportunity not to just gain money, but just mm -hmm. actually to be able, able to contribute in a very meaningful way to the ecosystem in terms of the building or, you know, um, I guess like, I don't know, in many ways, not only for as a founder, but as like a contributor or as like a, uh, a content creator or whatsoever or gamer even, I don't know, I, many, many aspects, but I think the, like the pure exposure to diverse projects, global projects, it's it's mm -hmm. very minimal. I mean, it has been minimal until recently. Um, so mm -hmm. the the reason why you're hosting it, this these type of conferences is like to attract, just to get a chance for them to meet together and to create mm -hmm. like new opportunities for them to just see the you know other projects outside of their own country, for example. And I think that really created many, many more, you know, blooming opportunities for them to explore new things um, and to see, uh, you know, very sol solid projects and the ecosystem. And my job is to select these solid projects and to invite them over to Asia just to, you know, because it really does matter. I think it really did create a huge, huge difference and it opened their eyes, but also it opened, you know, the community's eyes as well in mm -hmm. both aspects. So that really... Um, yeah, we really could see that in person. So that's why we keep doing this, right? So, yeah. <laughs> you, you talked there about uh, diverse projects. One of the things I'd be interested to, to hear as well is like, um, you're aware of like, there's projects like Women in Web3 and trying to bring more more women into into Web3 in the sort of the area around here. I've got two amazing female founders uh, in front of me uh, here from Asian markets. What's the state of the kind of the, um, the, the gender bias in terms of Web3 development? Uh, in your areas? Is it something that 
you still struggle with or are you able to attract more women into the space because for me diversity in general if we're building web3 if it's a new version of the internet i don't want it to be like the legacy systems we need inclusivity of all different types of people to build a great system um and my biggest fear is web3 ends up being run by a bunch of straight white guys just like the legacy <laughs> systems <laughs> like we need diversity what, what what's it what's it like do you find it easier is there more inclusivity uh, I mean, as a founder, to be honest, I haven't seen many female founders, Asian mm -hmm. female founders in, in Korea as well. So it's it's been, I mean, I've been in crypto for five years, but still I haven't really seen as many founders as I kind of wanted to as a fellow like mm -hmm. female. So it's been kind of disappointing on that front, to be honest. But in, in the future generation, I'm from like women's university in Korea, and uh, I invited many of those, you know, um, colleagues, I should say alumni, uh, fellow mm -hmm. students, like young students, to my Biddle conference in Korea, and uh, that's why the female like gender like ratio became really nice because mm -hmm. <laughs> it kind of leveled up. And I think people were surprised to see that like, oh, there's a lot of female students who are interested in building and right. learning about this stuff. Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was a very positive and evident trend to see. And mm -hmm. uh, also there was a, a company called Women Who Code. Um, mm -hmm. And I invited the Korean chapter, like the whole mm -hmm. chapter to the Biddle conference and they really enjoyed it as well. Fantastic. So yeah, I think, I, I mean, personally, I am trying to, you know, encourage and to help some, you know, younger females to join the force and <laughs> basically mm -hmm. like don't feel discouraged or intimidated, right? I mean, there's definitely a spot for you. Uh, that's mm -hmm. like my message to everybody. Um, and I just, I don't do it officially, but as a more personal, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a job, <laughs> I do help mm -hmm. them from time to time. And I think, you know, for Biddle Vietnam, it's been a very like just evident because all the, you know, staff for main staff for all female, right? <laughs> Nicole, <laughs> I, and, <laughs> and so that, I think that was really, really meaningful. I think uh, mm -hmm. it really uh, made, yeah, my heart full. So Nicole, you can, if you want to add more, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think this is also something that uh, I think across different countries, like even the US or Europe or Asia, we always have a, a session or a sidetrack for women, right? Even with hackers and, and so on. So I think we everyone also shared this mandate. Uh, and, and personally, obvious, uh, I, I do think that in Vietnam, we also have a bigger representation of female or women like founders in, in the ecosystem. And oh, I, as I mentioned with blockchain and Web3, it does actually open more opportunities for mm -hmm. non-developers, you know, and creators to start something. Mm -hmm. So I think pretty much um, blockchain is a more friendly kind of take genre for, mm -hmm. for women uh, versus other take genre that I know, uh, that I, I used to work with. So I mm -hmm. think this is also a, a great start and um, pretty much we need to keep up with this momentum and I think as Erica mentioned, I think for the for the female power founders, they need to see more. Uh, they need to see more examples. They need to see more role models, and they need mm -hmm. a safer environment. You know, just to mm -hmm. to really kind of exercise the leadership, and then they can actually be more confident in, um, let's say, in putting together what they what they want to do or what they want to start up. So I think that's like for me and and Erica. I think we don't want to stress out the. The gender diversity too much but it's going to be more about the i think the settings uh and the theme that we want to do with them so basically the, the i think the female founders they don't need uh like hands-on help or they don't no. need like you know like yeah but they just need this kind of setting an environment where they feel yeah, a safe environment they where you can be yeah. what they are so i mm -hmm. think that that's more important and that's when we can actually kind of talk more about you know uh, kind of make them confident with the caliber that they have. And it, it's more important than stressing that because you are a woman, so this is what we can offer you. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think that, that that's the difference kind of, uh, that's the different approach that we have. And I think even with our conference, honestly, we don't have a women in Web3 kind of sidetrack, but uh, we're trying to be more exclusive with the, uh, with, the, with the speakers and with the projects that we want to bring in. And for the next one, I think pretty much what we can do is that definitely we can bring in more of these like uh, successful cases or role mm -hmm. models, you know, just to, to come in here so that everyone feels that this is a very agnostic kind of environment for you, uh, you know, to be the, to be a builder. So that, that would, that would mean more to us. And I think more to the female founders. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I completely agree. And like I said, I, I agree with you that the, the, the web three community is way more inclusive and friendly than say, my experience in, in web two. Um, but my thinking is that, 
we've still we've got a window before it could go the wrong way and that's why i want to make sure we're having these conversations to make sure that people know like what we said creating that environment creating that setting that allows inclusivity of all different types of people to know that say there's a role model for you so you can see yourself in someone so i think that's the most important part mm -hmm. isn't it it's not necessarily say hand holding or anything because everyone needs to prove their own, prove their own worth but you need to be able to look to someone and say, oh, I can do that too. That person looks like me or that person reminds me of me in some way. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I think the emotional support is more important, right? I mean, mm -hmm. just the fact that just given more courage, encouragement, just those little words, right? That They do matter a lot. And mm -hmm. um, in the end, I think I I did mentor some, you know, uh, of my younger friends uh, but you know they would say to me those words really stuck to them um mm. and, and hard times and when i hear that it just really you know makes my day and i think it's just little things that matter but people don't really realize it but in the end i think they do play a big part in kind of boosting the, their courage up and kind of you know make them fly right <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah well, fantastic well guys it's been an absolute pleasure uh, talking to you both um before we uh, close off the podcast um what where where should people go to to learn more what's the next things coming up for you guys um nicole if i start with you uh sure so we have a twitter handle like biddle under dash asia uh you know for you to follow and check out our next conference as i said we're gonna have more exciting agenda uh next year and definitely this is gonna be something very um kind of you know a connecting or a dual conference between korea and vietnam so people would have chance to explore the ecosystem here much further. Uh, so we would have definitely keep you, uh, you know, posted about our, our upcoming activities. And Ooh. also, if you want to check some, you know, YouTube videos um, of our previous conference, um, you know, please check out the Crypto Soul YouTube channel. We don't mm -hmm. have, you know, it's a pretty big channel, so it's kind of has all the content from Crypto a uh, bit of Vietnam. But I think in the further, you know, uh, months upcoming, so there'll be more content. But you can definitely check out all the lineup, amazing lineup that we had. Um, so yeah, please do that and uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Keep us in Twitter is of course like our immediate channels and yeah mm -hmm. so that's fantastic that's guys well just stick around in the backstage area for a second um but for um this episode of a slight cast thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you all next time goodbye thank you bye, bye. bye.